Thank you. Thank you. Let me begin by thanking all of you. Love you too. And let me let me thank all of you for coming out this afternoon. Let me thank uh, Bob Reich for that introduction. As I think all of you know, uh, Bob was one of the great secretaries of labor in the history of the United States and is a phenomenal educator, not only here at Berkeley, but his writings are getting all over the country. So Bob, thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the book, but I suspect there are one or two other things on your minds as well. So I'll touch on, touch on those things. Uh, number one, Donald Trump lost the popular vote by over two million votes. And the importance of that is that you have got to know, and sometimes even our delusional president-elect has got to understand, that he does not have a mandate. He does not have a mandate. Number two, and even more importantly, on every major issue facing this country, poll after poll shows that the American people prefer a progressive agenda. In other words, the, in other words there is a time and a place where somebody could say, well, you know what, nobody agrees with me, but I'm going to stand with this position, I'm right, and that's fine. But on every major issue facing this country, the American people want progressive change. The American people want to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. That's not me, that's not you, that is the American people. The American people overwhelmingly believe it is absurd that in the year 2016, Women are making 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. They want pay equity. The American people understand there is something profoundly wrong when in a highly competitive global economy we have a dysfunctional childcare pre-K system. Hundreds of thousands of bright young people are unable to afford to go to college. Millions leave school deeply in debt. The American people want public colleges and universities to be tuition-free and for us to substantially lower student debt. Again, I say that not because it's a good idea, it's an idea that I believe to be right or that most of you believe to be right. It is what the American people want. The American people, Republicans and Democrats, think that it is absurd and grossly unfair that billionaires like Donald Trump in a given year pay nothing in federal income tax and that many multinational corporations making billions in profit pay nothing in taxes. The American people want progressive tax reform. The American people, where they are Republican, conservative, moderate, Democrat, progressives, understand that our current campaign finance system is corrupt. And the American people understand that too many people too many brave Americans have fought and died to preserve American democracy and that it is wrong that a handful of billionaires are now able to spend, as a result of Citizens United, unlimited sums of money to buy elections. The American people know democracy is one person, one vote, not billionaires buying elections.
And the American people understand that with 11 million undocumented people in this country, many of them working tirelessly, many of them getting ripped off on the job because they have no legal protection, the American people do believe that we need to move to comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. Again, that's not my idea. I'm not here telling you what I think. I am telling you what the American people believe. The American people know, and some conservatives actually have been strong on this issue, that it is totally insane that we have more people in jail today than any other country on earth, more than China, four times our size. We are spending $80 billion a year locking up 2.2 million Americans. And whether you're conservative or progressive, you understand that makes a hell of a lot more sense investing in jobs and education rather than jails and incarceration. Now, I say that to tell you that we, in terms of our views, are the majority, and that many, many people who voted for Trump for whatever reason support virtually everything that I have just listed off. Now, as we move into the Trump era, let me just say the following. There are areas, I think, there can be some compromise. There are areas where there can be no compromise. And the area of first concern where there cannot and must be compromise is beating back the Trump campaign where the cornerstone of that campaign was bigotry. No compromise with bigotry. No compromise with racism, with sexism, with homophobia, with xenophobia. On that issue, we will not compromise. I don't have to explain to anybody here at this great university the painful and rocky road that this country has traveled with regard to all forms of bigotry, starting before this country even became a country when the first settlers came here and did terrible, awful things to the Native American people, awful, terrible things which continue to this day. And I don't have to tell anybody here about the abomination of slavery or the fact that African Americans did not have the right to vote in many states in this country. I don't have to explain to anybody here, because you all know history, that 100 years ago today, women in America were not running for president. They did not have the right to vote. And I don't have to explain to people here that 100 plus years ago, children of 10, 12 years of age were working in factories, losing their fingers and their hands, working on machinery that children should not have been near. But as a result of the struggles in all of these areas and in other areas, if we were sitting here five years ago, eight years ago, and somebody jumped up and said, you know, Bernie, I think by the year 2015, gay marriage will be legal in every state in this country, the rest of the audience would have told that person, you're crazy, it can't happen. It did happen because people stood up and fought back. So two points, two points that I want to make in that regard. Number one, this country, through incredibly brave people, some of whom went to jail, were beaten, some of whom died. This country has made significant improvements in becoming a less discriminatory society. Do we still have racism and sexism and homophobia? Of course we do. But we should be proud of the progress that we have made. If we were here 20 years ago, believe me, and somebody jumps up and says, we're gonna have an African-American president, in 2008 and re-elect them. Four years later with a good vote, 
people would have thought that would have been impossible. We have made progress in becoming a less discriminatory society. And what I say to Mr. Trump, we are not going backwards, we're going forwards. So no compromise on bigotry, none at all. Second area that I think we have got to be very attentive to and where I also believe that there just cannot be any compromise. Mr. Trump campaigns all over the country and tells the American people that climate change is a hoax. Well, Mr. Trump, you've got to start listening to scientists and not just the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> Climate change is not a hoax. It is a painful, dangerous reality. Climate change is real. It is caused by human activity. It is already, as most of you know, already causing horrific problems in our country and around the world. What we are talking about is the future of the planet. What we are talking about are the kind of lives that our kids and our grandchildren and future generations will experience. We as human beings, along with people all over this globe, we are the custodians of this, our only planet. We cannot turn our backs on this planet we are going to take on the fossil fuel industry and transform our energy system. And the third area where I think there cannot be any compromise is the very nature of American democracy. Now, what democracy is about is sometimes you win elections and sometimes you lose elections. But where we are moving right now are two areas of great concern. Number one, as a result of Citizens United, as I just mentioned, billionaires can now spend unlimited sums of money to buy elections. What all of you should know is that for the Koch brothers and for the billionaire class in general, and for the leadership of the Republican Party, Citizens United has not gone far enough. Right now, what Citizens United means is the Koch brothers and other billionaires can spend unlimited sums of money in terms of quote unquote, independent expenditures. So they can put all the ads they want and do all kinds of other things independently of the candidate who they are supporting. What they want to do, and they're very upfront about it, is end all forms of campaign finance regulation. They want to move toward the day when the Koch brothers can give a check to an individual, say somebody who's running for the Senate in California, give that person directly a check for a half a billion dollars, or 300 million, or whatever it may be, and say, there is your campaign manager, there's your speechwriter, there is your media consultant. You work for me. You are my employee. It's my money, I own you. That is where the Republican Party is moving. Second of all, equally important, when Trump sends out a delusional tweet the other day, and I mean the word delusional, which says, I, Donald Trump, would have won the popular vote, or did win the popular vote, except for the fact that millions of people voted illegally, that is an insane statement. But, I mean, it's not just not backed up by any fact. Nobody, no Republican believes that. Nobody believes that. But, I think I understand what he was really saying. What he was really sending out was a message to Republican operatives and governors and so forth that you go forward aggressively in voter suppression. So right now you have all over this country states which have worked overtime 
as a result of a disastrous Supreme Court decision some years ago which gutted the Voting Rights Act. And they will try to make it harder for people of color, for poor people, for old people, for young people to participate in the political process. So you add those two things together. Number one, billionaires buying elections. Number two, a major effort at the state level and maybe at the national level trying to make it harder for people to vote. You will have the Republican dream of democracy, money buying elections and people in opposition to their ideas not being able to vote. People in this country, as I said before, have fought and died to defend American democracy. And I tell Mr. Trump and his friends, we will not surrender American democracy. Democracy is one person, one vote. We are going to make it easier for people to participate in the political process, not harder. And our goal is public funding of elections, not billionaires buying elections. So among many other issues, many other issues of great concern to you and to me, those are three where I just don't see any room for compromise. Not compromise on bigotry, not compromise on climate change, uh, and not compromise on protecting American democracy. Now, a lot of people are asking, uh, how did it happen? How did Mr. Trump uh, win? And uh, one of the things that exists, not a good thing, in our country is we live in a siloized society where we all talk to uh, our friends, people who share our views by and large. So there are many people who say, God, I don't know how Trump could have won. Nobody I know voted for him. And then there are Trump supporters who say, I can't believe that Clinton got two million more votes than Trump. Nobody I know voted for Clinton. And in a sense, both groups are right. But I do want to tell you uh, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that I think Trump won. Now, it is easy to say, and I heard a lot of people saying, well, you know, everybody who voted for Trump is a racist or a sexist or a xenophobe. I don't believe that. I mean, there are some people who do believe it. I don't believe it. Some of those people definitely did vote for Trump, and we're seeing eruptions of that, and we've got to deal with that. But I would say that the majority, probably the strong majority of people who voted for Trump are not racist and they're not sexist. What they responded to is Trump's claim, and this is just how crazy things are, his claim, a multi-billionaire who doesn't pay any taxes, that he is going to take on the establishment. All right? And the way I interpret that, and I'm working hard and I need your help on this issue, is that I don't see this as a victory for Trump as much as I see it as a defeat for the present Democratic Party, a party in... You know, what Democrats were talking about, and rightly so, is they say, look, hey, the economy today, we just had some good statistics come out literally today, lower unemployment. The economy today is better than it was eight years ago. And Democrats were proud of that, proud of Obama's achievements, and so forth. And that's true, and it's fair enough. But there is a major point that many Democrats missed that Mr. Trump did not miss. And that is that while the economy today may be better than it was eight years ago, the truth is that for the last 40 years on the Democratic and Republican administrations, we have seen a middle class which is shrinking, that today we have 43 million people living in poverty, and that we have more income and wealth inequality today, something that Bob Reich talks about a whole lot, more income and wealth inequality than at any time since 1928. And Trump understood that reality. What Trump was talking to is the fact that median household income, that family right in the middle of our economy today, is earning about $1,400 less than it was in 1999. What he was talking about is that the real median income of a full-time male worker is $2,100 less than it was 43 
years ago adjusted for inflation. Got that? So full-time mail worker in terms of real inflation adjusted for dollars earning $2,100 less than 43 years ago, despite the fact that technology has exploded and worker productivity. That worker is producing more, making less. Over the last decade, 81% of all U.S. households saw flat or falling incomes. Over the last 15 years, we have seen the closing in this country of 60,000 factories. Not all of it attributable to trade, automation played a role, or the reasons, but millions of decent paying jobs have been lost as a result of disastrous trade agreements where large, profitable multinational corporations shut down in the United States and went abroad for cheap labor. There is an issue out there that I think Trump also instinctively understood, and that is the incredible level of despair which exists in many parts of this country. And as I said before, we are a silo-wise society. Sixty, seventy, hundred thousand dollars a year, things are okay. What you may not know is there are places in this country, and I visited some of them. I went to a, a community called McDowell County in uh, West Virginia. Anybody that come from McDowell County? Southern West Virginia. This is a county that used to be a coal mining uh, uh, area where people had decent jobs. What is going on in McDowell County, what is going on in Kentucky, what is going on in many parts of this country is white, working class people today are dying at an earlier age than their parents in an ahistorical phenomenon. What life expectancy has always been about is that you live longer than your parents on average, your parents live longer than their parents, and so forth and so on. And that is true all over the world, and it's true in the African American community, it's true in the Latino community. But in areas of this country, white, working class Americans have shorter lives today than their parents. And the reason that most people think that this is occurring is these are people who are working for 10, 11 bucks an hour if they are lucky, lucky enough to get jobs. Their kids in many ways are going nowhere in a hurry. And they are turning to alcohol, they're turning to opiates and heroin, and they are turning to suicide. So there are parts of this country where the despair is so great. The world has left these people behind. They are not part of their communities. They're not offering anything. They're not being paid anything. And their futures look very bleak. And that type of despair is also what Trump put his finger on. Now, to my mind, I have very little hope that Trump will keep the promises that he made to those people. And we're already seeing, in terms of the appointments or the nominations that he's making to important cabinet positions, people who stand for exactly the opposite of what he campaigned on. He said, we got to stop Wall Street. You know, the power of Wall Street criticized Hillary Clinton for her ties to Wall Street. Well, guess what? To the surprise of nobody, he just appointed, nominated as Treasury Secretary, somebody deep in the heart of Wall Street. Trump said, hey, I'm the only Republican candidate. I'm not going to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And he nominated somebody to become head of Health and Human Services, whose main mission in life has been to privatize or cut Medicare. And on and on it goes. So we are going to expose the hypocrisy of Mr. Trump. We just had a trade situation recently. You know, he campaigned a whole lot about trade and outsourcing. And yet he just reached an agreement with Carrier. He said to the American people that he was going to impose these really very large tariffs. You shut down a factory in America, you're going to go to Mexico, man. You're going to pay a hell of a lot to bring that product back into the United States. Well, sits down with the United Technologies people who own Carrier, and he said, here, I'm going to be really tough on you guys. Okay, you can let half of the workers out on the street. You can fire half of them. We're going to go to Mexico. But for the other half, we're going to give you a $7 million tax break. That's how tough he was on United Technologies. 
a corporation that made $7 billion in profit last year. They don't need any more tax breaks from the American people. And when we talk about what goes on in America, and I have this stuff in the book, but you should appreciate this. <laughs> and that is, if you live in Fairfax County, Virginia, a wealthy community, if you are a man, you have a life expectancy of 82 years. If you're a woman, you live until you're 85. That's equivalent to what they do in Scandinavia. In McDowell County, the average life expectancy for a man today is 64 years of age. For a woman, 73 years of age. These are communities six hours apart by automobile. Our job is to not only expose the hypocrisy of Donald Trump, but it is to revitalize and bring fundamental reforms to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has got to open its doors to working people, to young people, to low-income people. I appreciate very much the time and the money that many um, upper-income liberals have contributed to the Democratic Party. I appreciate that. But the truth of the matter is the Democratic Party will not succeed by being the party of the liberal elite. It has got to be the party of the working people of this country. So I see our mission now as we go forward, and I mean we, all of us, in reforming the Democratic Party, two major goals. Number one, become an even more diverse party, bring more women into the party, more African Americans into the party, more Latinos, more people from the LGBT community, more Native Americans, more Asian Americans. We have to do that. But second of all, what we also have to do is create a party where all of us, white, black, and Latino, are very clear that in fact we will have the guts to take on Wall Street and the insurance companies and the drug companies and the fossil fuel industry and corporate America And right now, I am working hard, and I need your help on these things. As we talk about transforming the Democratic Party to make it a grassroots party, your voices have got to be part of that process. Uh, some of you may know uh, a congressman from Minnesota named Keith Ellison. And Keith is already getting beaten up by the establishment. Uh, I think Keith would make an excellent chair of the Democratic National Committee. And I think what Keith's mission would be is to recreate the Democratic Party into a party where we don't spend all of our time just raising money from the wealthy, but we spend our time bringing working people and low-income people and people of color together to fight for a nation and a government that works for all of us and not just the 1%. I think the most important task of the new Democratic Party is to think big and not small, to go well beyond what the media and most politicians define as our options. I'm going to be going back to Washington next week and the choices that I'll face are how much more do we spend on defense? How much do we cut Medicaid? How much do we cut Medicare? How much more do we give in tax breaks? to billionaires. Those are not the rational choices that we should be making. The issues that we should be discussing are why are we the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a right.
Why do we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs so that one out of five Americans who gets a prescription from a doctor is unable to afford to fill that prescription? How do we take on the greed of the pharmaceutical industry? And let me congratulate the people of California. You've done something very important. I think many of you are familiar with Proposition 61. And this is what you did, and this is no small thing. The pharmaceutical industry made, the top five companies last year made $50 billion in profits. They have hundreds and hundreds of lobbyists in Washington and at state capitals all over this country. In this one proposition, whether or not prescription drug costs would be lowered here in California, the pharmaceutical industry, and this is just unbelievable to me, spent a hundred and thirty-one billion, million, not billion, hundred and thirty-one million dollars to defeat that proposition, and yet we got 48 percent of the vote. But those are the questions. Why are we the nation with so much income and wealth inequality? Why are homeless veterans sleeping out on the street when there are those who want to give tax breaks to billionaires? Why do women make 79 cents on the dollar? What are we doing to combat climate change? So our job is to create a democratic party which thinks big, not small, which has a vision of where this, the wealthiest country in the history of the world, can go when we stand together. And I think when we bring forth that vision, and when we explain to working people and involve them in the process that, yes, we will take on Wall Street and the other powerful, powerful corporate interest, I think we can not only win politically, but I believe we can transform this country into a nation that you and I know that we can become. We can be the leaders in this world in so many ways. Think about a nation in which millions of people here are leading the world, helping to lead the world, transforming our energy system, a new transportation system, new weatherization, new sustainable energies, new innovations to lead the world to protect this planet. Think about the kind of effort that we can mount to provide quality health care as a right to every man, woman, and child. Think about a pharmaceutical industry which is not making billions in profit, but is providing the new drugs that we need to conquer cancer and diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. The potential that we have as a nation when we bring people together is just unbelievable. And that is our job. Our job is to understand that today, as we sit here in Berkeley, there are people hurting, and very hurting badly, all over this country, and we will not turn our backs on those people. So I know that... I know that as a result of the election, there are a lot of people who are frightened, who are in despair. But I will tell you this, if you study the history of our country, despair is not an option. It is not an option, not just for you, but for your children and your grandchildren and for the future of this planet. If there is a lesson that must be learned from Trump's victory is that we must increase our political engagement we must be involved in all kinds of creative ways, in creative ways to bring forth a progressive agenda and to stop Trump's very bad idea. So that's where we are right now. Not a time for despair, a time to remember the struggles that those who went before us engaged in against overwhelming odds. And to remember that today we are involved in a struggle, but when we stand together, when we act intelligently, we can be victorious.
Thank you all very much. Okay, and now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think, I think, so, oh, there you are. All right. Yes. Now we're going to do some, I think some of you have written out some questions and John is going to yeah, throw them at Marian me. and John, um, I'm John from Diesel Bookstore. Thank you so much, Senator Sanders. Uh, we have a few questions that we gathered at the beginning that people dropped off out front. And uh, one is by an inspired student, as he describes himself or she describes herself. After the primaries and now the general election, many people here in Berkeley went through a mourning period. Can, can you speak about the processes you went through and how we can bounce back into action like you have? It is appropriate when you lose, to take a day or two off. <laughs> but let me repeat, in, in all seriousness, when you deal with issues like bigotry and the incredible hurt that bigotry does to people, when you deal with issues like climate change and understand that if we do not act very, very aggressively today, the kind of planet we leave our kids, I've got four kids and seven beautiful grandchildren, and you have kids and grandchildren, that the planet that we leave those kids will be a much less healthy and habitable planet than the one that we have. You don't have an option of living in remorse or sadness. The only option that you have, the only, to my mind, rational, sensible option that you have is to figure out how we can be most effective in fighting back. And by the way, that's not just rhetoric. Here is a truth. It is as old as America. And that is real change never takes place from the top on down. And I always get annoyed. People say, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. It is not about Bernie. Bully. I, I, gotta, I wanna break the bad news to you. I don't have all the answers. It is about us, big time, you and me and him and her. It is about all of us coming together. When people come together, we become a power that cannot be resisted. That is just a fact. So when millions of people, you know, Trump may believe whatever he believes about climate change, but when millions of people, when states like California and New York State say, no, sorry, that ain't gonna happen. And our job is to figure out how we can go forward most effectively. What are the tactics? And we're all working on it, I think we're all thinking about that. But I would say that you don't have the time to mourn, you don't have the time to you know, wonder why. Now is the time, and the whole world depends upon us, our effectiveness in fighting back. That's the message of today. I've got a question over here. This comes to you from a 13-year-old student here who is admitting to playing hooky today to see you with her mother. I will write you a note, 13-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, in light of all the fake news that's been circulating, we'd like to know what are your sources for news? Well. This fake news stuff um, is a very serious issue, and many millions of people have read during the campaign stuff that was total lies, and we've got to figure out how we deal with that. At the same time, we're not stepping on First Amendment issues. But the more important issue is how we do a much better job in raising political consciousness in this country and how we do a better job in educating the American people about the reality of what's going on today. In the book, which I guess many of you have bought, go to the, you know, if you get bored in the middle, skip to the last chapter. <laughs> it's entitled, Corporate Media, A Threat to Our Democracy. 
okay? And what, and the essence of what that chapter is about is that for a variety of reasons, starting off with the fact that corporate America is owned by large multinational corporations whose job is not to propagate truth or to educate, but to make as much money as they possibly can. That's a fact. And the other fact is that you've got about six major uh, conglomerates, Time Warner, um, uh, uh, News Corp, uh, CBS. You've got a handful of major media, Comcast is the largest, who control about 90% of the dissemination of information that we get on uh, radio, television, uh, and newspapers. Um, how do we deal with that? And I think there are two answers. Number one, we have got to demand that corporate media start talking about the real issues impacting the lives of the American people. Now, I'm not overly optimistic that that will happen because there are such inbred conflicts of interest. For example, it's very, when you see so much advertising on television from the fossil fuel industry or the pharmaceutical industry, the truth is that they're not terribly likely to talk much about why we pay the highest prices in the world for medicine or the dangers of climate change. They're just not gonna do that when so much money comes in from these industries. But we do our best. And that's an area where citizens can become heavily involved. You can demand, you can demand that they start talking about why the middle class in this country is in decline. In the book, it talks about something and I don't mean to be bragging here, because it's certainly not the case. They talk about, somebody did a study, and they said, it turns out that I think it was the Sunday morning news shows, which are very important, that most of the discussion of poverty during the campaign, a significant percentage of the discussion on Sunday morning shows came from Bernie Sanders. Now, how does it happen when 43 million people are living in poverty? that most of the discussion on that issue comes from one candidate. Where is the media talking about the suffering of millions of people today? How come other people are not talking about that issue? All right, so we have got to demand, and, and another study pointed out that over 90% of media coverage in the campaign did not deal with issues, but dealt with personalities, dealt with emails, or people's attitude toward women or whatever. Not, not to say that those aren't important, but when an average person who's working 50 or 60 hours a week can't afford to send his kid to college, or a single mom can't afford childcare, she would like some discussion of the issues relevant to her life. But you can watch television for decades and not see that. All right, but the second thing is, and the internet opens up this opportunity, is how do we? communicate effectively with millions and millions of people? How do we talk about the role of money in politics? So I think that is an area that we also have got to focus on, is how we make sure that the internet works as a means, not for fake news, but to get good information out to people who today are simply, there are states out there where all you hear is Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity. Okay, in fact, another issue that we have got to be dealing with is how does it happen that in this country, which is split politically, over 90% of talk radio is extreme right wing? How does that happen? How does it happen that in cities in America where the Republicans get 25% of the vote, you can't find a progressive radio talk show? So when we talk about getting involved in the political process, figure out a way that you can demand corporate media to talk about the real issues, that you can demand that radio stations in your community start allowing progressive voices to be heard. Figure out a way that we better use the internet to get ideas out to people who have not been exposed to those ideas. A lot of work to be done in that regard. Both you and Trump are seen as outsiders, and that's why a lot of people gravitated to you both. What are the chances of having a true third party? That's a good question. You know, uh, you are looking at the longest serving independent in the history of the United States Congress, okay? So 
you know, I have some familiarity with this issue. When I was elected uh, mayor of Burlington, I defeated a uh, Democratic incumbent. Uh, and over the years, we run for Congress against Democrats and Republicans, run for mayor against Democrats and Republicans. So I know a little bit about the issue. Uh, you know, in Vermont, in fact, we now have a uh, pretty strong progressive party, uh, which just elected, by the way, a lieutenant governor. Lieutenant governor of the state of Vermont will be the most progressive lieutenant governor, I believe, in the United States of America. Okay, so we have three people in the state senate out of 30. So in Vermont, we have made some progress. And I think, you know, politics is an art and not a science. And I think you've got to look at the situation that you are in. Right now, the choice that I have made is that I will do everything that I can. And I've recently been made a part of the Democratic leadership. So... And the responsibility that I have been given is outreach. And my job... And I need help on this. Let me tell you, because nobody knows how to do this. Certainly it has not been done. How do you create a broad-based, diverse political party? How do we create a mechanism by which the chair, I would say 98% of the American people have no clue who the chairs, their state chair of the Democratic or Republican Party. How do we create a vibrant party? where people are feeling good, are actively involved, are talking about the issues, are demanding their elected officials get involved in those issues. Nobody knows how to do that. It's never happened. I'm trying to do it, and I'd love to have your ideas and your help. But the end of the day is if we can bring millions and millions of people in there and say, you know what, this is my party, and we are going to fight for working families, we're going to fight to create much better educational opportunities. We're taking on climate change. We're going to go for a Medicare for All single-payer program. If we bring people into the party, we can transform America. And I need your help to do that. So get involved. Get involved locally. Get involved at the statewide level. That's where I am focusing right now. So... What are the chances we can get rid of the Electoral College anytime soon? Okay, good question. All right, these are really great questions. Um, I don't know what the chances are, but let's just look at the facts. Two important considerations. Number one, uh, Hillary Clinton ended up with over two million more votes than Donald Trump. Donald Trump is going to be inaugurated. Something is not right in that picture, right? Uh, we all grew up believing that majority wins. The person who gets the most votes wins. In this case, Clinton got the most votes, but she's not going to be inaugurated. And that, on the surface, uh, seems to be uh, unacceptable. Second area, and maybe I speak just as, as somebody who gets involved, you know, and works hard in politics, uh, and in California, you will appreciate this. Uh, the way the nature of uh, the Electoral College right now is everybody knows that the state of California is a strongly democratic state. The state of Vermont is a strongly democratic state. The state of Wyoming is a strongly Republican state. Mississippi is a Republican state. So what ends up happening is when candidates run for president, they focus on 17 or 18 battleground states. So they spend a lot of time in Michigan and Ohio and Florida. They don't spend a lot of time in California or Vermont for that matter or Wyoming. So the needs of the people of those states really don't get paid a whole lot of attention to. So to answer your question, I think we need a serious discussion about how we address that issue. Clearly, the status quo is not working, is wrong. How do we get people to understand that they're voting against their best interests? And what can I do to help the disenfranchised to realize they can make a difference? I think if, again, I think this issue uh, comes back uh, to the weakness of the Democratic Party. If the Democratic Party had, in fact, raised the minimum wage to a living wage, if the Democratic Party had provided and passed legislation for health care for all, if the Democratic Party had, in fact, passed pay equity for women, if the Democratic Party had put 
many billions of dollars into rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure and creating millions of jobs that the Democratic Party had led the effort in terms of criminal justice reform or in terms of immigration reform, people would know which party was fighting for them. But the truth is the Democratic Party has not done that. They do better than the Republican Party, to be sure. But it is not good enough for a major political party to say, vote for me, because these guys are much worse than I am. <laughs> that is not an agenda that you can run on. So, you know, what I think is that, uh, and where my mind is right now, and again, we, are, we just got this assignment a week or two ago, and we're trying to figure out how best to do it. Um, no, because it has never really been done before. How do you create a real, with a small d, democratic party where the ideas and needs of people filter on up to the elected officials and where the elected officials are held accountable by the people? All right. All right, so we're working on that, and we need your help. Uh, so maybe that's all I'll say on that one. Yeah. All right, I'm getting dizzy. Who's going? Okay. All right. <laughs> Mary, Mary. I got a million of them. All right. Are you worried that any bipartisan, in quotes, cooperation with Trump will lend legitimacy to his politics of hate? That's a very good question. And, and as I indicated, I mean, the way I see it, and, and people can disagree with me, the way I see it is, and I just I started my remarks off by saying that no, there can be no compromise on bigotry. Uh, there can be no compromise on climate change. There can be no uh, compromise on protecting American democracy. But if Trump comes up, Trump campaigns uh, on the need to rebuild our infrastructure, well, our infrastructure is crumbling. Now, the proposal that he seems, he hasn't come up with a defined plan yet, seems to me a pretty dumb one. It's giving tax breaks to large corporations and privatizing the infrastructure, something you might expect from right-wing Republicans. But if, in fact, a compromise can be worked out in which, in fact, we have a decent plan to rebuild our infrastructure and create millions of jobs, yeah, I think that is something that we can work with them on. Uh, I think uh, that in terms of trade policy, you know, it turns out that he's backing away from what he said. But by the way, I don't know, you know everybody here may not agree, but one of the victories that the progressive movement has made uh, in the last year is the defeat of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. So how do we, and this is something that Trump, you know, talked about a lot, how do we create a trade policy in which corporate America reinvests in this country, creates decent paying jobs in this country, Country? How do we rebuild our manufacturing base? How do we make sure that when people lose their jobs because of automation or whatever, they're not simply thrown out on the street? Right? Trump talked about new trade policies. If he comes up with something that's halfway decent, now he's already backed off of that. But again, we will hold him accountable. And if he can come up with something uh, that makes sense, yeah, I think we should work with him. But I think on the basic fundamental issues of bigotry, uh, of climate change, of democracy, no, there cannot be any compromise. This is the last question. Sorry. <laughs> Automation caused unemployment seems more of an issue than TPP. What do you think should be done to make it possible to learn a living that is a basic income? Good. Um, I mean, these are exactly the kinds of questions which need discussion, which get virtually no discussion at all. And this requires us to think big and not small. Technology should be a positive. There is nothing wonderful about working in a factory 50 or 60 hours a week. Nothing great about it. But it is better than being unemployed. So the question is, how does it happen that with an explosion of technology and an increase in working per worker productivity, 
so many working people have lost their jobs. So the answer, really answer your question, speaks to about creating a very different type of America. An America that starts off with the premise that every one of our people, men, women, and children, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, will have a decent standard of living. And if some robot comes along to take your job, we should see that as a positive thing, not a negative thing. If you're working 30 hours a week rather than 60 hours a week, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. But you need the income to take care of your family. It's, we cannot continue to live in a society where technology and greed rule. Hey, sorry, we've got a new machine, you lose your job, you're out on the street. No, we've got a new, a new machine. You have to work less hours, but of course you're going to continue to get the income you need to take care of your family. I mean, but that really does require a political revolution. When I talk in the book and I talk about, you know, every day about a political revolution, what it means is there is no defined revolution. You are the revolutionaries. It means that questions like that are exactly the difficult questions, not easy stuff, that we have got to tackle. But I think it gets back to something that FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, talked about, which got no attention at all. Actually, Michael Moore picked up on it. I don't know if you, any of you saw that. Michael put it in, uh, I don't know where it was, one of his last films or something. He had a film of FDR talking about uh, a second Bill of Rights. Any of you familiar with that? Yes. All right. And what the second Bill of Rights was about is not just the first Bill of Rights is protecting our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, all of that stuff, good stuff. The second Bill of Rights talks about economic rights. It says that people in a democratic, civilized society are entitled as a right to have a job. It talks about the right to health care, the right to good education. Now, the difference between us and the right-wing people is they believe in a market economy where if you have, your goal is to make as much money as you possibly can, and in the last 15 years, we've seen a tenfold increase in billionaires. And they can make as much money as they can. And if you have nothing, tough luck. You don't have any health care. You're old. You don't have enough money to live on. You're a baby, not getting enough food. That's the matter. That's not their concern. All right? But our job, I think, is to fight for, in fact, that concept of human rights. Health care is a right. A decent job is a right. <laughs> Protecting the environment is a human right. Ending bigotry is a human right. All right? And that's what our struggle is about. And these are not going to be easy. You know, people in this room will disagree. Open it up. Well, I think this, I think that. That's fine. We've got to learn how to work with each other. But I think on all of those issues, as I said at the very beginning of my remarks, you will find the vast majority of the American people supporting our agenda. Don't ever forget that. So we've got a lot of work to do in the weeks and months and years to come. We got a lot of work to do it. Let's go forward together. Thank you all very much.